Y'all should actually go listen to that track and uh, send some love to Sila. So let's see if we can get this working now. Boop. Perfect. Awesome. How's it going, Sila? You are on. Oh, I can't. You can't hear me. There we go. Now you can hear me. Perfect. So welcome. This is Sila over here on this side of the screen. Say hello to everyone. Ooh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. I can. Oh, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I just can't see your cam, but I guess that's okay. I have you delayed. Yeah. On... There we oh, go. There, there, there we, we go. go. Perfect. Hey, all. Awesome. Howdy do. So why don't you uh, start off by introducing yourself to everyone in chat. Everyone say hi to Sila. Hi, Sila. Hello, chat. So um, I'm Sila. My real name is Alexi. I'm yeah from Finland. Yeah, I do all sorts of music related stuff. And uh, I, I do mixing, I do mastering. I do this artist thing called Sila. Uh, what else is there, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess um, what else there is is sort of I guess we can kind of just dive right in. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your backstory? Like, where do you come from? Like, how did you get into music? What is the Silas story? So basically, uh, I started drumming when I was like 10. I think it was 2005. And um, it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm I'm like an art school kid. Uh, I've been in music schools like the, my whole education edu education like path. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to the army with like the music stuff. Like we have a conscript band in Finland. Yeah, uh, I was a technician there. Uh, met a lot of great people, and uh, now I just. A couple of years ago, I finished school as a like a vocational school for music technology. So I'm a certified professional. That's awesome. Um, so how many instruments do you play? Because I can see a guitar there in the background. We can see your your fancy old fucking Juno over there behind yeah. you. Yeah, it's it's showing right. It's, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this strat that I love a lot. So you can play keys, you can play drums, you can play guitar. Can you play any other instruments? Are we, is there a hidden yeah. flute history in the Sila discography? Well, being, being able to play is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> I, like, I know my way around a keyboard. I, I know how to get chords from there. I'm an okay drummer, like, okay ish mm. i think i'm i'm I'm, a, I'm so rusty right now with drums uh and i compose a lot of my songs on on the guitar oh cool actually, actually this specific guitar uh because i really think it helps to bring in the human element when writing songs writing riffs writing anything that's awesome no i mean i i i dig that um so like what would you say are your um, influences or inspirations, um, both musically and like outside of music? Like, was there any experiences that you had? Like, did your time in the military influence your music at all? Like, can we talk about that stuff? Well, um, like a lot of my music comes from learning. It's, I want to say that. And then just randomness, of course, because everything every artist that does like glitch music or bass music will say that their music comes from experimentation and randomness and just harnessing randomness. But uh, I like to think myself as uh, like a learning writer, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. For example, when I heard what a Neopol Neapolitan sixth chord is, I immediately went home and tried to write with it 
And uh, nowadays, because I'm not in school anymore, I uh, browse YouTube a lot to learn like sound design stuff and other other stuff that might inspire me to do something I wouldn't have done if I hadn't seen the thing that I just saw. I'm with that. That's actually really cool. Like I I I often say personally that like learning something is one of the biggest inspirations for me like being able to say like I figured out x thing um yeah. is like a big is a big part of like why I want to make music so I can say I did that um and I yeah. know how that works. That's similar for you then? Yeah, a bit. Like for example basic shapes that track we just listened to, mm -hmm. uh, that just came out because I was in school and we were going through like string arrangements and we were learning like, why don't you put the third for the first violin? Because if it's not like perfectly tuned, the uh, note, then it'll sound horrible because it's the highest one. So it's safer to put the root note of the chord for mm -hmm. the first violin in a like a quartet situation and and stuff like that. And then I just went home and put that in use because I don't have any cool sampler instrument library things. I just like made do with uh, what, I, what I had, which sure. was serum <laughs> at that time <laughs> and a lot of distortion that's dope um so would you say that your music has kind of evolved with you um as you've learned yeah. or are there like big shifts like how has the how yeah. has the silas sound grown like would, if we listen to your first track and compared it to now would we hear a through line or were there like big big changes as you learn things well, it's gradual, I think, but like a good example of what you're talking about is like my latest two releases, my two latest releases, which were Phrygian Pie, which is uh, on my SoundCloud, and then the Symbionic remix that's mm -hmm. on there too, and on the remix album, because uh, the Symbionic release might actually be the latest track that I've done and released. And it showcases a lot of the things that I've been uh, experimenting with lately, like uh, fusing electronic drums with like a rock type drum sound with like a lot of China symbols, uh, splash symbols, uh, crashes and uh, and then Phrygian Pie is a lot more minimal. Uh, it's uh, way more electronic and uh, just simpler. And I guess a bit louder. <laughs> <laughs> hey, louder sometimes better. Um, that's that's really cool. Um, so if we compared, like, let's say let's say we took the first Sila song and like compared it with. Uh, Let's say Phrygian Pie, because I think that's one of the tunes we're going over today, right? Those other two, those are same. That's the same thing to me. To me. Oh, for sure. Yeah, Phrygian Pie is an old track. I just refinished it. Oh, I dig it. So, do you do you tend to kind of sleep on projects? Not to like say you're ignoring them, but like, do you spend a lot of time kind of like bring older projects back? Like, or are you kind of a um, I take older ideas and create a new idea out of them. Uh, I don't like the idea of like going back and fixing and changing things, but lately that has worked for some reason. Okay. And uh, like a couple of years ago when I felt like I started this project before I had released anything, before I had like even chosen the name for it, uh, I was making tracks and we were deciding with my management that uh, which of those tracks will be released. And uh, I have quite a lot of songs that are still to be released. And so 
when I finally do release them, it might be like two years after I've made the track. Mm -hmm. And because I like to like study all the time. And of course, you learn when you do things. Uh, the tracks sound bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> two years. So I just uh, refinish them is the term I like to use. I'm with that. Well, that I mean, happened with basic shapes. That was a year old when I reopened the project and just added some symbols and uh, fixed the mix down. Uh, with Phrygian Pie, was like maybe two years or something. Oh, wow. But as I release a song uh, uh, per month, I think that we're, we're starting to, to get real close to uh, today. Oh, that tracks that are newer. Cool. Well, kind of on that note, like, what are you what are you working on right now? Like, what's gonna be coming out for the Sila project? Let's say, in the next two months, not going too much further than that, because we're gonna talk about that more later. Uh, in the next two months, I'll put out a new song. Obviously, uh, that'll be out in like I don't remember the day. It was like. 20 something of September, maybe 29th. Okay. No, not 9th, maybe 27 or something. That, that last week of September. And uh, then a next song. Uh, we've been talking to some labels, not much. It's kind of hard to uh, get your food in the door. Yeah. So to speak. And, um, but outside of like new releases, I'll I'll be working on new music when I have the time to do so. But like for the near future, I'll be playing my first international show oh, in cool. France, and I'll be leaving like uh, on Friday actually, and that's something I guess. Hey, no, that's fun. That's fun. You're starting to go into the touring world. I'm with that. Well. Um, yeah, starting might be a strong word there, but I hope, I hope. Oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Well, why don't we, why don't we switch gears a little bit and start going into uh, the projects that you want to talk to about today? So, um, do you want to start with the uh, Phrygian Pie, or do you want to start with well, the? Well, I have it loaded, so why Alrighty. not? Well, so why don't we first? take a listen to Phrygian Pie, and then you can start loading up the project, and then we can start talking about it. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Cool, sounds good. so I'm gonna be playing it uh, on my stream in just a second. I just gotta load this up. Let's hop over here to show everyone the track. And then, uh, if there's any point at which uh, you want to stop uh, and talk about something, let me know. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to start in three, two, and...
stereo percussion is so sick. Was fucking sick. Oh, this outro, by the way. That's really cool. Uh, let me just get this set up. Bada bang. Alrighty. That was sick. Let me put this all down here a little bit so that people don't see me. Oop, nope. Let's not play whatever this other track is. It's not yours. <laughs> awesome. So why don't you uh, start going through the project and uh, let us know what you want to talk about. Like, you have free reign, so go wild. Okay, okay. You might regret that <laughs> in a couple of minutes. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll just mute my headphones because I can hear myself from there. So um, this whole thing started with the riff, of course. Like I had an idea I read on a blog or something that people have used like mathematical uh, constants or like numbers or series of numbers to make music essentially. So that's what I tried to do because and uh, Pi is an like obvious choice because it's just Pi. Everybody knows Pi, even if they don't know what numbers are in it. So I just thought that like, yeah, I'll just uh, put the digits of Pi into uh, F sharp Phrygian scale. And then go from there. And that's actually what you hear in the outro. Uh, it's an arpeggio in F sharp Phrygian. Oh, and with it the follows... digits of pi. Oh, I think it's like that's sick. the eight first digits or something. I'm not quite sure. That the serum patch I have for it is so it's it's a bit like complicated so it's not obvious but because i think the pi melody is copyrighted if i recall correctly oh well could you just play the like the pi melody solo because i see it there at the bottom of your project yeah it's right here this it's not coming through is it no we're not hearing it yeah i have yeah there's this disc thing Oh, um, now it should there be. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so it's. Oh, that's cool. Like, it sounds super mechanical. It's weird because it, it sounds almost atonal, but it works with itself. Yeah. And from that, I just pause stretched it and made that. Um atmospheric thing that's in here somewhere i think it might be this thing but yeah like there's no chance oh uh, no 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 it's this one it's this one sorry
Oh yeah, you can hear all the uh, the pulling of the pulse stretch. Ooh, that was cool. What was that a uh, little glitch right there? So that's this, but like stretched a lot. But of course, you can't. There's no possible way you could tell it's there. Mm -hmm. Like that. That is what the song gets its name from. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a good choice on my part, but I it was a choice I did. And uh, then from there, I was like, uh, I can't really use this for a riff or anything. So I just put some uh, notes into the. Actually, I used the I used FL when I made this project, like for the first time. And uh, uh, I've just put like some notes into the FL riff machine, and it gave me something along the lines of the riff that you hear. Oh, interesting. That's the. That's that thing. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, so wait, how does the FL Studio riff machine work? Because I've I've never really gone too deep into FL. Like I started off with it like six years ago at this point, uh, but I switched over to Ableton pretty quickly. So I'm not I'm not super familiar with all of their devices. Um, yeah, I mean, you just give it some parameters, and then it just has uh, has some like like rhythm templates and uh, progression templates. And then you just hit random and uh, give it like stuff to go from like, uh, do you want it the, uh, uh, is it ambitus in English too? too? Like the distance between the lowest and the highest note. Oh, the ambiture, I think is the term. Ambiture, yeah, okay. Basically the same thing. So you give it that and uh, a scale and uh, the notes you want in the riff, like I gave it the F sharp Phrygian, uh, Phrygian scale. And then after a couple of clicks, it gave me that riff thing or something close to that. It's It's been a couple of years, so I don't remember exactly, but it's pretty much that. So then I just... Uh, wait, these are the re-recorded guitars. I played it myself because that's what I do on the guitar. Oh, that's a live guitar. Oh, nice. And uh, that's the that's the springboard for me to make a track a whole track if i have a riff like that that like is in any way good or catchy i can just go work off of that uh and uh, <laughs> actually uh, a fun little uh tidbit is that i couldn't play the fifths myself so like the power chords that you play the riff mm -hmm. with so i recorded the fifths like separately as a separate take and then just summed it all together together so i get that final version which i think is this one Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it's like, so it's almost like you have like individual power. Yeah, there's some palm muting going on. Yeah, and that was all of the guitars I had at the time. I when I refinished it, I recorded three more tracks: a left and a center and a right, because that's what gives me the sound I'm looking for when I play distorted guitars well can you talk for a moment about why you do three takes instead of just like two split takes or even just a single uh take for your guitars or for any of your tracks because uh, i've heard you talk about it, especially for vocals that you're not a huge fan of double tracking vocals you like to have at least three takes yeah at least three i would like five 
for the lead. But yeah, um, it's good to have a man mano present presence there, I think. And uh, playing a lot of takes is like using a doubler, but so much better because that width. I, I hate that word with <laughs> <laughs> comes from uh, that. I mean, the sense of width comes from what's different between left and right channels. So that is by default, uh, th that gives you width by default when you play them because you can't play it exactly. And if you do, congratulations, you're the best guitarist ever. But like, um, I can actually play you because there's the big Dunt channel with the new guitars. That's the full array of guitars. Mm -hmm. If I have only the mid one, or the mid ones, I should say. Because this one has a mid channel too. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when you compare that, uh, and then I guess I should do this. Too, yeah, too. and that's kind of what I wanted to touch on is, is you advise against yeah. just doing this. Uh, so why don't you like only having double track, like only a left and a right with no center? Mm, I mean, we can listen to the difference. Uh, I just think it sounds better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, this is only the sides. Then with the mids, oh yeah, it sounds way more full, definitely. Um, and it also, it, to my ears, it sounds like the uh, like when you just have the two sides, it sounds like it's kind of washy. Whereas like it feels yeah. like the the center one adds like the clarity and the punch that we're missing from the sides yeah. Uh, takes. Yeah. Plus, when you add the bass in, uh, I think, I honestly think that synthesized distorted basses and electric guitars are a match made in heaven because they just work so well together, as you can hear right here. Can you though? Yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. Like, this bass sound isn't anything special on its own. Like, it sounds like this. Oh, yeah, that just blends in in tone with the guitar. I didn't even really notice it, like, until you soloed it. Yeah, I mean, as far as bass patches go, that is not, like, good on its own. It's not wide in any way. It's just a bass, but then when you let it fill the gaps in the guitars, that's when the power of it comes out, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a very, um, it's a very rock or metal way to approach your, ooh, big wash out there. Um, it's a very rock and metal way of applying bass to a track where, you know, yeah. you uh, you low cut the shit out of your guitar so that there's like nothing under like almost like 150, 200 hertz uh, even sometimes I've seen on some EQs. Um, but like the bass guitar, since it's following an identical rhythm, or I guess in this case, the bass synth, um, it yeah. just sort of uh, psychoacoustically fills in that space in our brains. And we don't even notice that it's there, um, but it just makes yeah. the whole sound feel full. Which, like, I have to imagine that is a bit of a, like, bad news for the bassists in metal bands. They're <laughs> like, yeah, you just exist. <laughs> That's your job. You just fill in the blanks. But, I mean, they do a great job at it.
Yeah, we have. Uh, a- yeah, let's actually see because I have a spectrum analyzer at all times on my master chain. The where the guitars are hitting. So there is actually quite a bit of low end there, but it doesn't really matter because there's no like real bass in it that it could mask. Yeah, this is also just. There are more intense examples of that that I have in some of my songs, but yeah, whatever. Um, then there's the other interesting part in this song, I think, is the drone thing, which is this one. That's fat. What is that? Uh, I mean, I think it was like a clip from the movie Crank. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah. There's this uh, guy that says, this is why I'm here is some hardcore shit or something like that. And I just put it through like a primal tap, I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't remember like 100% because it's been a couple of years and... Uh, and when I did made made this sound, I thought it was cool, but I didn't know what to do with it. Which also is bound to happen, of course. Oh, so this wasn't designed for this project? Or yeah, was yeah, it? not at all, not at all. Oh, I was just okay. lucky that I had the sound to use. It was like, it was one morning after some party or a rave or something and me and my friends were at my place really hangover and just like messing about but yeah i got that out of it and uh then there's the alarm sound that that is kind of a defining element i think Is that Which also is from another project? Actually, one hundred percent stolen too. Oh, <laughs> where is that from? Uh, I, I mean, not 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 exactly stolen, but it was like a pop project because I was doing a lot of pop like songwriting and producing production uh, at the time when I still thought that was a good idea for me. Um, and a friend, we were making a track with with a friend and. Uh, he had this really cool like trumpet type lead in that project and then we added some synth to it and then i just had that stem on my hard drive and i was like yeah let's use that oh so that's like a trumpet like a live trumpet or like a vst uh sampler no i don't i'm not really sure because uh it, it might have some synth trumpet in there okay it was just called like a trumpet when I got it, let me see if I actually let me see if I can still find have it. it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's what that is. I dig uh, it. Well, can you talk? I it, actually, like, ooh. oh yeah, well, just do your digging, and then once you're, if you find it cool, we can take talk about that for a little bit. But either way, uh, after this, ooh, oh. Sounds like some synth brass. That's cool. So you just took like the yeah, first that bit was of it. Something for a pop project. Then I just, as I do, added some distortion on it. <laughs> so now it's mine. Now it's hey, nothing like a bit of grit to give something some unique quality. Um, yeah. <laughs> speaking yeah, of yeah. grit, can we for talk sure, about the sure. drop synths? Uh, sorry, you uh, cut out. Or can we talk about the like the drop synths, or were those uh, yeah. also sampled? Uh, those actually were inspired by a Dead Mouse stream, where he just uh, put the chaos thing in Serum, 
there's a note on and there's the chaos mm -hmm. things and which means that when every time you press a note it randoms out uh, it it gives you a value so dead mouse used that for the wavetable pa parameter and uh, just recorded what came out so that's basically what it is it's the riff but like not in its entirety because i like to i wanted to like release the tension in the end of the song mm -hmm. so uh here are the synths i guess so there's the main one which is this So you, uh, I think you can hear the riff, mm -hmm. the guitar riff in there. It's just the uh, beginning of it. And then there's like a few layers that like alternate, come in and go uh, out. Oh yeah, I can see those. There are these ones. So it's a lot of layering on top of specific hits, but moving between which hit is being represented by which layer. Yeah, yeah, and it makes it gives you the illusion that it's more complicated than it is. The, like the the main bass patch, because it feels like it's the same sound, but it's changing all the time. Now, how long did these sounds uh, stay in MIDI before you rendered them out? Or did you like render them out right away? They were never in MIDI. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, for like, sure. Because uh, I, I recorded the, some random arpeggios or something with the serum patch that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So af after that, I ran the same thing through lots of like trash, pre trash presets and um, maybe Saturn too. Uh, just a lot of like different weird effects and distortions and then again, more distortion and then some more distortion. And uh, then I just got some cool textures that I could use to support the main bass line. Oh, that's so cool. So it's, I mean, I've I've done that myself too, where it's like, you know, you, yeah. you start recording the loop into a new audio file and then you're just like clicking through presets, you know, in like yeah. spec ops yeah. or in trash. That's, see, I, I think that that's, that's really cool. I'm noticing actually a lot of stacks right there, right where your mouse is yeah, at. Yeah, these ones. Yeah, can you talk about like um, why you have so many different stacks for one hit? Um, as opposed to the other sounds. Yeah, yeah. This is actually an interesting one because if I remember correctly, yeah, there is no main bass in this on this hit. Mm -hmm. So there's just an E that I played on on the guitar, like really loudly, like picking the string, like so it pitches down now, mm -hmm. and you know. Uh, and hits against the fretboard and stuff. That twang. Uh, then there's uh, one of my favorite sounds. Uh, like, it's a classic from... There's this Pirate Station DJ set by Sigma that I have had in my life for, like, a decade soon. Oh, that's I awesome. Think. Do I still have it? Yeah. Oh my god, I still have it. So, I just been suddenly ghost! Sigma! Oh, that's loud. Ooh. That's wait, so is it from that? Like is it just that opening vocal sample? Or is it from the rest of the project or the rest of the sample? But yeah, this one. And there's this really cool track in here. Yeah, this one. 
I know that sample. Yeah. Like they start the set like with a double drop of two classics or something. It's it's really great. And uh, I don't know where I got this from. Might be on a website, on a Russian website, of course. Nice. It's a Russian festival. But yeah, that's like, wait a minute, 11 years old now. And there's, uh, the song is called Ladies Night or something. And it just has this this screaming sound that's awesome. so i just found that from somewhere i think i might have uh ripped it from that track or something it's the same sound is on pendulum's island part two i guess yeah i think i've heard it there like i mean that's a, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. classic ho so sample yeah so it's kind of like a staple sound like a rave sound like one of those sounds that you just know. So I used that, and then I guess I tuned it with the guitar. Yeah, it, it kind of sounds that it's in tune. Um, then there's a layer of the drone from the beginning, because I wanted to tie the sections together somehow. Because I, I hate doing songs that like have nothing to do with themselves. Yeah, like you there's a, a section of... and then there's another section and then there's another section. I just I don't like it. It's a pop thing, but like I think it like makes the song that song. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean it, it creates a a cohesive um, kind of tonal structure to the song where yeah, even and, if the uh, yeah, and go for identity it. exactly yeah exactly I was going yeah. to say yeah and then there's the sub because you need to have a sub of course yeah and like that's it I have then when I mixed it I added some EQ and uh, imager of course I have I use this a lot it's a free plugin it's really great. Do you have um, like the actual ozone imager? Or do you just use that one because it's it's good enough? Um... Uh, cause it does the th same thing as the multiband thing. Mm -hmm. But like, if I want multiband, I'll just do it myself because I don't have the uh, like ozone five or eight. Oh, for sure. has been upgraded by the host and now includes unlimited I guess it's now upgraded then. Okay, yeah, I think because we've we've gone over the 40 minutes for the for the three person call. Um but that's 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 all good. Um hopefully that's not costing you any money. Um It's not. I actually just got a message on my like other computer that they gave me a gift. Oh, awesome. And they removed that 40 minute time limit. That's sick. Cool. Well, why I'll take it. Yeah. Sure, Zoom. Thanks. Shout out Zoom. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is there anything else in this project you think might be cool? Um, I actually want to talk a little bit about two things in the project that I noticed when you sent it to me. Um, yeah. But yeah, sure. first, I want to go over anything else that you think is really important. Well, I just think that the memes are cool because there's a track that's called Horrible and. Uh, Oh. I think that's pretty accurate. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is there anything other, anything else that's cool? Well, the drums I th think are always cool because I'm like that's how I learned to do music, like doing with uh, from drums. And just so you know, real snares have curves. <laughs> oh, this awesome. one doesn't uh, at all. Yeah. And that's, again, because of uh, trash, pre trash presets. I just had a snare that I liked. Uh, I think there's a layer that I stole from a song. I won't say which one because... I'm a thief. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, sampling uh, is like, condoned, but not discussed. Yeah, yeah. And then there was another layer that's from my sample library. And then 
I think there was a layer from a Celeste. Do you know the instruments? Oh, Celeste? yeah, like the really, really high pitch piano, basically. Yeah, yeah, because it has a metal me metallic, metallic quality to it. So I just uh, smashed those together, fixed the fades, and uh, just distorted the fuck out of it. <laughs> That's fucking sick, dude. Um, yeah, and what you're hearing the variations in the in between the snares, like between the snares, not in between. Um, those are just different trash presets, like. Yeah, each snare hit like feels a little the different. Vocal yeah. qualities and stuff. Those exactly. are just trash presets. Oh, that's dope. Um, were how long did it take you to um, decide maybe I should stem these out together? Like, how long were they as like a, a full layer, or was that like an instant thing? I don't actually remember. Uh, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, those might be just like four separate files those those snares mm -hmm. there's no layers there there's just a hyper distorted snare snare uh let me see if i have it i should have it yeah these ones oh so that's like from a sound design session basically yeah that's like and that's january 2017 maybe Jeez. No, no, no. That that's that has to be older. Well, anyway, I can actually show in Explorer properties. Yeah, 2017. Nice. And I just like put them uh, in the place of a snare, and because uh, they're all made from the same layers. Like the uh, original layers, the Celeste and the Stolen Snare, and the one third, the, the third one that I don't remember what it was. Uh, it, they kind of sound the same, but still, they don't. Yeah, they they share the same kind of uh, like texture, but they yeah. have different kind of spectral profiles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I just, uh, in this project, I used Spiff and then some EQ uh, and then, then Transify to really bring out the low mid attack of it and remove some of that really, really harsh high end sus sustain. And then I used this trick that I like to use a lot on snares and uh, pretty much anything really to just uh, soft clip. Oh yeah, the, the soft uh, clipper in the glue compressor is is so clean. Yeah. I use that all the time. I think there's some compression happening. I'm not sure. Let's see. Yeah, like uh, just a little bit maybe, to yeah. really bring out the transient because there isn't a lot there to begin with. But without these Sounds like this. And then with. So it's really nothing major, I think, but it's there. Cool. Um, so uh, anything else or do you want to go into the, like, cause there's two things that I, I mainly want to talk about. Um, one of which being your side chain trigger, the other being your reference channels. Yeah. So let's let's start uh, about the, which one do you want to go through first? Let's start with the side chain trigger. Uh, so talk about yeah. how you do side chaining, and then we can go into your reference track because I think that okay. uh, the reference yeah. track is an important thing to talk about. So I want to spend a little bit yeah. more time on that. So I just want you to kind of go over this real sure. quick. Sure. Uh, uh, so the side chaining. Is a just a eight oh eight, just an eight oh eight clave. Yeah, clave. Yeah, clave. Yeah, which is just a snap, a sine wave snap. That's just really short, and then I send that to the live native 
compressor, but it's the old one. They wait, is it? No, it is. It's no, not. This is the actually. new one. Yeah, it doesn't look like you're using it's the, the new Live one. 8. But uh, then again, with this project, I had already sidechain as we can see here there's yeah. fades and stuff all over the place so the sidechain is more the sidechain that you have in this project is more kind of shoring up any inconsistencies rather than kind of serving the traditional role of a sidechain compressor yeah because i had already done that a couple of years ago in fl with that really great um what is it envelope controller and midi triggers oh for sure which is the best way to do a side chain ever. I'm with that. But ever... I don't have that in live. I could buy something like the gatekeeper or something, but this has given me the results I need. So I haven't really touched on that. But the really important part to me mm -hmm. with this is the naming convention that I have, which is a hashtag and the name. Like, this yeah the the pound sign or the hash mark oh, uh, which, yeah yeah, yeah. Can so you... it gives you that number of the track yeah because that's something that i i notice a lot in uh people's productions um is like whether or not they want to keep that number in there because for people um just people in chat who might be unfamiliar um when you rename a track in ableton if you include a pound symbol or a hashtag uh symbol uh, I think it works wherever it's placed in the name, but uh, I usually just keep it at the beginning. It'll actually replace that with the um, the number of the track that it is from top to bottom in your session. Uh, no, it's so, only in the beginning. So it's, yeah, so it's only at the beginning. So uh, you don't obviously have to use that, but I think you and I have a similar perspective where having that visual reference makes uh, side chaining easier, it makes uh, resampling easier, um, yeah. and it makes stemming stuff out way well, easier. To me, more importantly, mm -hmm. you can route things way easier. So if I have an EQ, like in like with re reference tracks or something, yeah, yeah. I can just go here and then I need track 50. And, and there then there it is. Yeah, absolutely. And that becomes important when you need to do side chaining. And as you can see, side chaining doesn't have the number. So I can just uh, go and choose one of my side chaining presets that I have made. Yeah, yeah. For example, the glue one, I rarely use it on my own stuff. But then I just go here, press S, C, and uh, it didn't work, of course. But yeah, if you do it fast enough, you can have. <laughs> And that now it's set up, it's ready, awesome. ready to go. And this just goes to sends only. There's no sound coming out of it. And now, if you if we'll just check this one, it's pumping with the MIDI triggers. And oh. this is useful because you can use groove templates. Uh, and when you want to change the stuff, it changes everything at the same time. It's that's one trick I found really useful. Oh yeah, I'm I'm with that absolutely. Um, so I look at your project and I see at the very bottom what your mouse is kind of hovering over the references. So yeah, um, I have gotten into uh, a lot of conversations, a couple disagreements with people over uh, when to reference how to reference, and if referencing is even a good thing. So why don't you give me your perspective and why uh, you reference the way that you've uh, done so in this project? Because I'm noticing it's mostly your own tracks and then a couple of other tunes from producers who uh, I think both you and I respect immensely. Yeah. So um, my non-diplomatic answer for referencing is do it always as much as you want and need to and uh even more than that because it just like if it sounds good it sounds good and you don't know if it sounds good unless you compare it to something else that sounds good to you and uh i really can't figure out why you wouldn't reference at all like that makes no sense to me 
yeah. at all. No, I mean, <laughs> I get that. I mean, I, the the argument that I've heard um, generally comes down to one of two things. Either mm-hmm. one, the person believes that they have such a unique and original sound that they can't find any references, which I will say personally, I don't think is true. I don't think that's possible to not be able to find any song that's even remotely close to the style and the sound that you're going for. And then the other thing I've heard is that they're worried about becoming a derivative artist and not having original thoughts with their music. Okay, so let's break those down. The first one doesn't matter, like, at all. If your music is like noise you will find noise music and you can reference those tracks uh so you can compare that uh, the loudness of the uh, between yours and the other track Uh, you can compare how much top end is there is you can compare compare how much low end there is and uh, stuff like that that like i could reference my tracks to some pop mixes because the i i let's do it like i have bought the latest chromio album which was sublimely mixed it's it's oh, yeah. amazing how much loudness they got from it especially considering and they're have- all analog too like that's the thing that always blows my mind like they're almost entirely out of the box yeah well their year is but the mix probably isn't oh that's true good point but yeah, let's slap like Juice here from the album. Amazing track. So I hope that you won't get banned for this. Oh, I'm sure. Worst case scenario, they mute the uh, the audio. But if you give us like just a couple of seconds, I'm sure it's fine. Yeah, uh, I don't need to give you audio. Ex- uh, uh, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. I don't need to even give you audio. Oh, yeah. So there's the curve for the Chromio track. No effects on it at all. And then there's the curve for my track. And uh, we can have them side by side. And we can check how much high end they have and how much high end I have. Yeah, and obviously, like you're saying, there's going to be major differences in, like, bass music and the stuff that you make and the kind of pop music that they're making. But I'm noticing that in, like, the main sections, what we're looking at right now, um, I can see that your frequency profiles are relatively similar, almost identical. I would say that your track has a little bit more bass, which makes sense because you're doing more bass music yeah. and they're doing more pop music. Yeah. But like the overall slope of things and the way that the brightness kind of peaks up um, in the yeah. choruses is very similar. And that's my point exactly. Uh, it doesn't need to be the same genre. It doesn't need to be even like good if your music isn't good if you want to reference against something that's bad then go for it yeah but like it gives you a like a reference point to how much top end there is and how much low end there is and that's an important part of referencing i think and after a while you find the level that things should be at like for me, it's this that I'm hovering over right now, mm-hmm. the minus 30 line. I know right now, after doing this a lot with my own tracks and with other people's tracks, that if top end or low end goes above that line, it's quite a lot. I won't say it's too much because people do that. Noisier bases can go to like minus twenty four or something, some something like it, they're they're just insane. Yeah, but yeah. like it's it's a good starting point, and you won't learn that if you don't reference at all. Like, mm. and music never exists in a void, so why not do it? 
No, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm curious. Like, do you ever uh, reference based on uh, songwriting, sound design, or um, song structure? Yeah, sometimes. For example, this track and the next one I'm putting out next uh, this month, they're both really, really inspired by uh, Royalty by Shady End. That came out like roughly at the same at the that at that time. Okay, because that was a real eye eye opener track for me. Like I wouldn't have thought that you can do that. <laughs> Like I had listened to a lot of Cohen sound and noisy and stuff. And then Shaden just comes in and uses noise because he wants to. And then it's like, okay, I can do that. I can do something like that too. Which is why you'll notice that in here there's like just noise. Because why not? Yeah. I mean, it's I, I like that because it's it's honestly the way that you're framing it. It's actually a, a tool of liberating you to do more of what you want, because it's almost like you're getting yeah. permission from someone else, even though yeah. you don't need their permission. Having that reassurance is honestly like a beneficial tool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better, better myself. Cool. Uh, then there's my own tracks because I have started to put out, put out music like a year ago. And I would like to, of course, have it sound better. Uh, but then again, I, consistency is key when creating a brand. Oh, so, so you want to make sure that everything sounds it, like Sila. Yeah, yeah, which is which uh, makes remixes harder because often you're not in control of the master. So for example, the latest master, uh, the latest remix I put out is that that's not mastered by me. So uh, I think it's, you can hear it really well, but then again, it fits in with the rest of the remixes, but it has a lot less low end, uh, high end than I would like myself for my tracks. But then again, it's more important that it fits in with the rest of the album and the rest of my original works. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then there's just the Vozo tune, which is yeah. like, it sounds smooth, but it's still loud, which is weird. Uh, and there's, I asked, I actually asked Vozo about this, this notch in 7K. Like I asked that, what was that all about? Because if I tried to do something like that, it would sound absolutely horrible. Like yeah. here. Oh yeah, I see that big old dip. What's yeah. so what's going on there? I don't know. It's just that's what the mastering engineer wanted. And uh, who am I to talk? Like this track sounds amazing. Yeah, I mean, if it works, <laughs> then then that's all you need to know. If it sounds good, it is good. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, so I interesting comment here in the chat from Noise Signal. Um, I think a reference only becomes bad if you attempt to copy everything. Then your own tune can become contrived. But all you have to do is avoid doing that. I I think that's a good point. Yeah. Like, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a mindset thing. If you're setting out to copy a track, then you're going to copy a track. And if you can't like catch yourself doing that, like before you do that, then I really don't know how to help you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that ties into kind of like the second argument that I've heard a lot of people being afraid of becoming derivative. And like you and I have talked about this a bunch where um, yeah. like uh, if you are an artist, part of being an artist is consuming or absorbing all of the things that are coming in around you. And it could be uh, any number of things. It could be stuff that you experience in life, things that you eat, music you listen to, art that you observe. Yeah. You take that into yourself and you are creating a derivative of that just because of the way that your brain works. Um, yeah. 
So I, I, I've always uh, found it interesting. And, and for me, like looking through this project file, it's, it's reassuring because I can see that not only are you using other people's songs, you're using your own songs, and I can hear the connections. Like I can hear the relationship between, you know, a shadiant tune and your tune, but it doesn't sound like you are being quote unquote derivative. You're just in the same vein. You're approaching the same mood because you two have similar sensibilities. Yeah. And I think that's the difference between like copying and taking inspiration from something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think that about does it for for this tune unless there's uh, anything else you wanted to to talk yeah, about I mean, i'm looking at the chat so if you have any questions now is your time now is your time yeah. well for now let's just hop back to the webcam so people can stop looking at this uh this ableton screen with no with no human beings on it <laughs> yeah yeah um and what was the uh other project uh, while we're kind of waiting to get set up um, what was the other thing you were planning on on showing off I'm uh, moving back to the webcams now so I think you might have to stop uh, screen sharing for it to go back perfect there we yeah. go I mean I don't remember but I can open any project that I have <laughs> so yeah, well, if you have any ideas yeah, I mean, what I was thinking of uh, going over was uh, some work in project or work in progress. Like the idea is oh. to, yeah, if you're if you're comfortable with it, if you're not comfortable sharing a work in progress, that's totally fine. Um, mm. I'm just I'm just yeah. curious to see what the differences are between a finished style of project and something that is. Um, still in development and if you'd rather uh just send me a audio file so we can listen to it that works too um i don't want to i don't want to make you feel put out in any way yeah i'm not i just don't really have anything that's a work in progress that i'm intending to finish but i have a good example of a track that i'm probably not gonna finish but what it looks like when it's being made that might actually be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why don't I'll, we get that loaded? I'll open it up just a second. And uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, catch up on uh, hosts and follows and stuff. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you to uh, Symbolic Deuce for that uh, follow. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful name. Um, thanks to everyone for hanging around for this. Uh, this has been, honestly, this has been really fun so far. I've really enjoyed this. Um, and uh, I think once we once we go over this, we could also actually um, use this as a springboard into kind of the, the other aspects of this section of the interview that I wanted to talk about. Like, um, let's say uh, you want to start a new project. What is your mindset when going into uh, like a blank Ableton project or what have you? Because I know that like uh, I've talked about this before uh, during these interviews, like the, the curse of the virgin canvas where you're staring at a blank screen and you have no idea what to do. Um, so what is your process and what is your uh, mindset when doing that? Uh, that's when I usually go to my sound design folder. Or just pick up a guitar, uh, start up the Juno, just start like even I'm I love keyboard instruments because you can do this and be in a like a musical space. Mm -hmm. Like uh, of course it's not even on right now, so you <laughs> actually need to hear something. But like that's really important. Okay, this is not the project I was looking for. Uh -uh. Um, but yeah, I'll just start with the music. Trying to write something, trying to like look for crazy samples and doing a sound design session to springboard yourself to into making a song. Oh, for sure. So it's so yes. you I think a good idea. So you, do, you don't normally go in with the idea of like, I have this song in my head and I want to write this song. It's sort of like you go in and you see what comes out 
um, well, just from kind of playing around? Not never. Oh, okay. Sometimes I'm like in shower or something, like in the shower, and I'll just have this groove pop into my head because everybody knows that the shower is the only place you can actually think in for some reason. Yeah. But like, it's it's weird. I get a lot of ideas in the shower. Uh, but like, and that's why my landlord hates me because I use so much water. I tried to cut down on that. But like, uh, having an idea helps, but can actually slow you down, I think. Because if you have this great idea, like I have a bunch of like riff ideas or chord progression, pro- progressions or stuff like that on my in my phone that I have just like played at 3 a.m. on my guitar. Mm-hmm. And uh, then if I try to make a song based on that, I might get stuck because I don't want to abandon that thing that I had, the idea, the original idea. Yeah. And I wouldn't advise like letting yourself be slowed down by that. I think it's important to realize and uh, I don't have the word, but That's realize when you're getting like stuck and when the original idea or the concept is weighing you down and slowing you down. Okay, so it's it's a matter of learning how to like um, and I've, I've used this term before, like, uh, I call it killing your babies where, you know, you have yeah. all these ideas yeah, exactly. that feel super exactly. precious to you and they all matter because you created them. They belong to you. They're your inspiration, your ideas, but yeah. sometimes you can't yeah. hold on to them. You can't be too precious. Um, so I, I, I am with that 100%. Yeah. And the good thing with computers is that. Yeah, yeah, and the good thing with computers is that you can always save it. You don't have to, like, kill it. Like, in a songwriting session that you're writing a song with some big writer, uh, you would have to abandon that for now, and that wouldn't go into the song that you're writing. But when you're doing it alone in your room with just you and your computer, you can just save it and then come back to it if you feel like that's something you could do. Yeah, like you can kind of uh, take all of these offshoots from like this main idea that didn't mm-hmm. work with it yeah. and use those as seeds for new ideas. Um, yeah, new exactly. Tracks. exactly. I'm with that. I'm with that. Um, is this project uh, already? Or? Yeah, it's, it is. It is. I'll just start sharing. Cool. I'm going to make you nice and big. Everyone gets to see your pretty face for a half a second. <laughs> awesome. So let's take a listen to this. And then uh, if since this is still kind of a work in process um, or work in progress, I yeah. should say, you can pause at any point um, and just kind of uh, take us through the, the process. Yeah, yeah. And uh, another, th- another, an- another thing <laughs> that I really like that... Uh, or I have started using and utilizing is the unused folder of tracks right at the bottom of the session that I just can drag stuff into that I might want to abandon at some point. And when I start mixing, I just delete the folder. And then it is in there in an older version of the project. And I like... You don't have to commit to deleting something with the folder. You can like lie to yourself a little bit. Oh, so like, it's like a I'll recycling bin. Maybe I don't. And that's really helpful. It gives you a sense of security. I'm I with think. that. Yeah, no, that's that's smart. It's kind of like um, just a repository and also kind of like a recycling bin that you haven't emptied yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. For sure. But... Uh, uh, this is the project. As you can see, there's a lot of guitars in here. I really like the drums on this. I really like the Hoover sounds. I have started wanting to use Hoover sounds in every track I do. 
<laughs> nice. Because, I don't know, it's kind of cheesy, but it's really good. Uh, I mean, the Hoover sounds are cheesy, but they're just so effective in their own way. But yeah, uh, I'll press play and uh, hope you guys won't die of cringing or something. Oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. You could probably turn it up about five or ten decibels. There we go. Like, uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing I've been like experimenting with a lot lately. Yeah, I really a lot dig of guitars, it. a lot of like drum stuff. That's really cool to me. Yeah, there was actually a question in chat. Did you did you record the drums live uh, with a drum no. set? No. <laughs> oh, really? But I'm really glad that it sounds a bit like that oh yeah i mean the breakdown um about halfway through those drums sounded like straight out of a kit like it sounded like you mic'd up a whole drum set like uh, this part over here yeah oh wow <laughs> So that's all that's all audio. Let's hear the drums. I love all those little cuts. Those are so good. And what I think makes it sound like a kit is that I use a lot because, again, I'm a drummer myself. 
So I like to use a lot of like symbol articulations, uh, which are like choked symbols and uh, uh, like a pedal hat. That's never in EDM, like yeah. this sound. I mean, actually, one thing I've noticed when listening to your music, you don't use hi-hats nearly as often as most other artists. Like in Phrygian Pie, I don't think there is a hi-hat in that track, is there? Yeah, there isn't. There isn't. I hate them. I, I just hate them. It's so hard to, like, make them sound natural and not, like, awkward. Mm -hmm. But with pedal hats, it's a lot easier and oftentimes i would like like an open hat like uh, all the way open hat maybe a little bit close so it sizzles and uh, just hit really hard with a stick because that sounds heavy to me oh for sure that's like it flows really nicely like actually i have the brake that i've used um this one it's from this band called idols which is the best band right now is that from a record Take or did you actually out. get that from like multi-tracks oh that's from the record yeah i dig it and uh i i that wasn't the best example of the kind of hi-hat i'm talking about but still I think that's the kind of sound I'm looking for. And when I can't have that, I just get frustrated a lot. And then uh, I really like to use rides because yeah, rides that. are just cool. And I associate the ride sound with a like open feeling because when you're playing a ride, it's on your right hand. and. Uh, your body is all open oh yeah i mean with hi-hats like i feel like hi-hats and it kind of goes back to what you're saying like hi-hats are almost like overused in dance music i rarely yeah. hear rides outside of like drum and bass music these days yeah oh yeah that that brings me home that's so nice yeah and that makes it sound like a okay. cat and then there's the open hats and the pedal hats and the chinas and the splashes. These are like these make it sound like a kit. Yeah, just it just adds all this air. It kind of acts like a almost it almost acts like overheads. Yeah. And uh of course the my favorites, which are the choked symbols. Wait, That's sick. These ones. And this one. Yeah, hitting and grabbing the symbol, yeah. Yeah. And uh, that makes it sound like someone's playing because that, that sound like requires a player. Yeah, you need someone physically grabbing the, the symbol. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. That's and then there's just a lot of different samples, which makes it sound, again, like a kit, because it isn't repeating the same sound, even though there is a 909 crash. In yeah, but it's layered with another that, one, and it's not used like for all the... Orchestra crashes. Yeah. And all sorts of stuff like that. But those are the things that make it sound like a kit. Yeah, well, there you go, Almar. Now you know. Just add a shit ton of different samples everywhere. Yeah, I mean, that's the way to do drums, in my opinion. Like, in basic shapes, there's a lot of symbols, and there's a lot of, like, uh, first half with this symbol, then it changes to the pedal hat thing and stuff like that. Yeah. So how did this track start? What was, like, the first element in this project? Uh, I think it was this riff, which I hate now. Uh, 
Oh, I that's... just wanted something that will hit you in the face repeatedly, and then it'll start, it'll start to go into the flow of things. But then I, I don't really like that anymore. But because, uh, the reason why I started this track is that uh, I had a friend over who does circuit, circuit bending. Mm-hmm. He had this old like flea market kids piano from China that has only like the white keys because putting in black keys is too expensive, I guess, or something. <laughs> and he just opened it up and messed with it. And uh, we recorded that. And there was this really cool sound that came out of it. Uh, let me see. Yeah, this one. This is like a sample from the, yeah, the circuit bend, bent instrument. I'll just take everything off it. Ooh. You can hear all the noise in that. I love the timbre yeah. on that. And I love that sound because it reminds me of the 90s breakbeat rave thing. But it's because then there's the sounds that you just know which are in this plugin, this one. No, oh, yeah, you show me this before. Yeah, uh, they're all there. You can like pinpoint where they're used, and oh, that's that sound, and oh, that's in million uh, a million tracks. But that sound gave me a feeling of the '90s rave breakbeat thing, but it wasn't familiar in the sense that I've heard it before. And the fact that we made it by using the Juno as a control voltage into the circuit bent children's toy piano thing would just like, I had to use it. Oh yeah. But here we are. <laughs> well, I mean, like with that, it, it kind of it goes back to sort of what they were doing back then. Cause I mean like 30 years ago, you didn't have all of the bullshit that we have now. Like there wasn't a serum, there yeah, wasn't massive, yeah. there wasn't like a whole host of like uh, software DSP effects. So basically you had people making tunes out of Casio keyboards. Um, and a lot of times you would get sounds that would feel like a fucking circuit bent fucking toy piano from China. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause that's basically what people had to work with. So even if yeah. you are using modern sound design aesthetics, modern processing, like that source sound. And then this, this kind of uh, is something we could probably talk about a little bit later, but like the importance of getting a good source signal and applying a lot of interesting processing to that rather than focusing so much on like, I wanna get like the exact synthesizer patch that I want. Sometimes you wanna get something yeah. that is just really, really cool sounding, but isn't like something that you have total control over. Um, and then you process it with a bunch of, you know, distortion and EQs and stuff like that in the box to make it feel more um, modern. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Plus, I had when I started this project, it was my face. Uh, July, I guess. So I had just like discovered. I I had known about G Jones before, but like I had like procrastinated on actually checking his music out. So then when I finally did, I was like, yeah, I want to do something like that. Amen Briggs, fuck yeah. Nice. Amen Briggs and loud synthesizers. That's my shit. But then again, I have wanted to do one tet to do something that feels like me. And at this moment in time, I guess that's a lot of guitars and cymbals. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's definitely a very um, hybridized thing because it's, you know, there's the big thing in dubstep where you have kind of all these metal and post hardcore uh sounds being pushed in yeah. against a bunch of dubstep basses and this is kind of like <coughs> excuse me the more breakbeat glitch um kind of variant on that where you're using a lot of metal sounds but this feels more technical um in terms yeah. of the way that the riffs feel in terms of the way that the drum design feels 
Um, and uh, I think that that's, that's a really cool direction because it's not something that you hear a lot. So for you, it actually is a very identifiable sound as like the Sila style, um, which, is, which is really cool. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I have to feel for my manager because it's his job to like try and brand me and manage the brand too. And I'm just like, yeah, this is the track I had. Like the concept for was that every sound has a tonality. And then there's this just just noise. So have fun. <laughs> Enjoy. Yeah, let's let's brand that. Let's make it a consistent brand that's easy to sell. Like uh, <laughs> hats off to him, I guess. Yeah, good luck. Well, um, is there yeah, good else? luck. <laughs> is there exactly. anything else you want to talk about with this project? Um, the gu guitars, really. The, uh, I mean, these are basically the same. This project is actually a great example of the uh, match made in heaven between synthesized bass and the guitars. Let me just check if there's something I'm missing. No, there isn't. So there's this Reese bass. It looks like you have uh, three layers there, one of which is going out to um, uh, Serum Effects. So there's a lot of stuff on there, uh, as you can see yeah. right here. <laughs> so uh, the, the sample, you would say, is like the main layer. Is the operator working as a sub bass? Uh, wait, this, these ones? Yeah. No, the, there's operator. The, yeah, that's the sub bass that has not a lot of going on, I think. Yeah, that's just a sub. Okay. Then there's sure. this uh, sub bass patch that I use a lot, which is from my ambient project. And this note right here is an a Korg MS20, a vintage one, vintage one, because the new ones are ruined. They're not as good. Oh, interesting. Uh, a vintage Korg MS20 driven into a tube preamp, like a valve preamp, like really hot, and then driven back to the desk that had the two valve preamps, and then driven to the desk a bit hot. So it's like a good analog synth that's driven through analog gear a lot. And I just like how it sounds. Uh, let's... I mean, it's a sub, so there's not much there, but I'll try to... Yeah, but when you bring it up with all that processing, it probably adds a lot of character. Yeah, so this is the sub with, like... Is there a filter on it? No, there's pretty much nothing on it. Some FM in the sampler, which is mm -hmm. a good trick if you don't use this trick. Just try it. Yeah, it just adds a bit of power and grit, yeah. Yeah, uh, then there's a lot of processing on it. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot basically of... basically just... Yeah. A lot of distortion, compression. Uh, then some, like, motion. Some, like, filter animations. So we can distort them again. A yeah. few times. What's Serum Effects doing? Yeah. Serum Effects, the, does it have an audio in? So I can use the filter here too, and I can key track it. Too. I didn't even know you could do that. Wait, so in Serum Effects, you can use the noise oscillator as like an audio throughput? Yeah, yeah, you can. So you can use the first filter, and then uh, by using this external instrument thing you can route midi into it so you can key track the first filter oh, that's sick. so I... you can have a chain and then key track filter it again 
That's awesome. I had I had no idea you could do that. Um, the noise signal is saying it's in one of the more recent updates to CRM. I need to check that. Um, yeah, that's really Which cool. Is, it's it's cool because you can also use the oscillators. Oh, so it's just the serum like in between your processing chain, which is wild to me. <laughs> That's intense. Yeah. Like I can just go in here and add another Reese to the Reese. <laughs> Yo, dog. I heard you like Reese's, so I put a Reese in your Reese so you can Reese while you Reese. <laughs> That's fucking That's cool. cool. Yeah. But yeah, then there's this. I really love this sound right here. Oof. Yeah. Is that a Saturn or the decap? I don't really know. There's a lot of going on, but it's like some widening. Uh, uh, I think there's a high pass filter. Oh, uh, for sure. And then the reverb sent to like make it wider again. Uh, but most of it comes from the the FM, I think. Oh, OK. I can see. Oh, it doesn't. Then it's just. Uh, well, it's something. Oh, sure. sure oh, 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 yeah. I, it's this filter. Oh, because you... It's oh, resonant you, bandpass filter. Yeah, you automate it on. And, that yeah. goes into all of the processing I have on it. Oh, that's fucking sick, dude. Yeah, plus the reverb on bass, it sounds unor unorthodox when you, like, talk about it, but then when you actually try to apply it as a technique, it really works. Sometimes, not always, but, like, for, to accent some things or, like, uh, to bring out to widen your base all of a sudden it it works like that oh yeah to add just some i mean it's everything is on the table as long as it works like as long as it sounds good yeah. um i think that's a, a big takeaway i've i've been finding from from this one specifically like there's a lot of stuff that i personally wouldn't do when i was like just starting to work on a project but it totally works for the context of this tune and for yeah. your other tracks as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then there's this, these sounds, and I, I started reference uh, started like when I started this tune. I was thinking that it'll be like something of an a prodigy or G Jones hybrid thing, but then when I got here, I started thinking about fellow feeling again, mm -hmm. which is a trap for myself because it's such a great track. I've always wanted to do something like that. But then again, when I try, I end up trying too much and the song ends up like crap. That's so, uh, the story of my life. These sounds, I think, are really, really cool. Um, and these are just made by putting weird... Uh, max for live effects on something I have on the tune already, like the guitars or maybe the bass or some or the the sound design things that are here. This is the palette I'm using for the song. Nice, which has all the Is bored as shit. <laughs> what the fuck was that last one? Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, the, the toy piano has a microphone, because of course it does. <laughs> so this is my friend talking in the, into the mic. And uh, oh, that's so funny. with all the circuit bending going on and uh, just being real hangover because this was the morning after Finland won the hockey championship. So we went to the marketplace as we do in Finland. And um, uh, this is how he sounds. 
Yeah, that sounds hungover. <laughs> that sounds like the that sounds like the weight of a thousand beers weighing on yeah, one person's soul. Yeah, I mean, it was a long night. What's this? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, then there's just a lot of stuff like this. Just That's a bunch of from random that, sounds, yeah. Uh, toy instrument. And I just pulled these into that uh, channel I had that weird Max for Live stuff on. I'm pretty sure I don't have it on that on here anymore because Max for Live doesn't really work for Windows. It's annoying, but it, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, these sounds. See, what's interesting for me is uh, like when you solo them like this, they don't mm -hmm. sound at all coherent. It just sounds like a yeah. random mess of stuff, like, almost like you're switching through radio stations. Uh, yeah. But in context of the song, it all works together. Yeah, I mean, when you have something that your brain can follow along with, like that bounce, like, uh, 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 that progression that I have, mm -hmm. then everything else is just ear candy. Or I, w I wouldn't say that's candy, that's more like chili. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's got that spice on it. Then there's way too many like harmonies that I just like to write because I think I can, but then I can't. So it ends up like this. I'm like, let's add another voice to it. Let's add another voice to it. And then it just end up, ends up like, like this. Sometimes, hey, sometimes that happens. sounds really cool like i mean i feel like in like the context of the tune it can get a little hectic but like there's just so yeah. much cool things going on within that that like i totally understand where where you're coming from with it yeah yeah and it's i i don't know i don't know but then again this part feels like so far away from this part which was that this one oh yeah which I now feel is like the best, uh, at least the strongest part of the song. But even that, I feel like needs a top line, meaning vocals maybe, mm -hmm. or some synth melody thing, or it's like something, because it just doesn't feel like there's enough there. Yeah, it's missing the but hook. That's probably why I won't finish this, and I'll just do something else with the sounds I've created. But I'll have to see when I have time to like actually do anything about it. Totally. Um, anything else, or do you want to kind of keep moving forwards? Let's let's go forward, or I'll just be stuck in this project for the rest of the night. Alrighty. Well, you can uh, you can close that up. I'm gonna move you back over here yeah. to the corner of my screen so everyone can see your beautiful face. I'll fix my um. posture real quick because <laughs> I just. I was like this. <laughs> I know, I know. That's the producer hunch.
Um, okay, yeah. so yeah. there was a quick donation question, uh, which I guess we yeah. could talk about before we go back into kind of your process. Um, uh, the Tooth Fairy, a.k.a. Lil Tooth, who I'm assuming is still in chat, donated $2 to ask, do you have any studio horror stories? A lot. A lot. Do you want to share just like one or two? Uh, just like working with people that are really incompetent is one. Mm-hmm. But like... Uh, one was when I was hired to be an assistant in a recording session and a writing session that featured one of the top female rappers in Finland right now. Mm. Like she's on the Spotify front page like every other weekend. And uh, I, I go there, I have no idea who she is. She's a nice woman, uh, but like we couldn't set up the producer's computer with the uh, uh, Apollo interface that the studio had. Uh, so we had to call someone from the studio that it was like at 8 p.m. So they had already left because, of course, it's like a 95 studio kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had to disturb someone that uh, the guy who we disturbed is actually a legend in Finland like a pop producer legend. Uh, so we had to disturb him to get an focus right, like to I2. Oh, like one of the old, like, uh, yeah. solo Scarlet Instead things. Instead of the Apollo that we had in the studio. And we couldn't use the vocal booth to demo. So I had to like, bring the microphone from there to the control room and then i had to patch it in, patch it in like manually <sighs> and uh, this, this, uh writing studios like that don't really like you taking apart their complex uh patching stuff and yeah but nothing like more severe than that i think there has been some times when, like, the performers were really bad, but then it just play, hit record and deal with it. Oh, it's part of the job, really. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the, the moral of the story, it sounds like. Is it's just, like, even when everything's going wrong, like, you, you have to uh, get the client's job done. Um, so yeah. it's... Yeah. <laughs> But then again, the good experiences really often uh, outweigh the bad ones because when you get the good artist that you like and who you're a fan of, mm-hmm. it's really great. Like I had last week, I had uh, this young woman come in here that uh, had this rap project that he had a grant for like 1k or something really Mm -hmm. small but it meant that they could hire me to record and produce her vocals and when i was like talking to them about what the project is she was like yeah this is uh like a fena swedish dialect that even swedish people have a hard time understanding and i'm gonna rap in it oh that's and sing some in it and i was like okay then let's let's do it and i had no idea what i was going into and now i just i fucking love it it's so great the songs are great uh she was a great performer not a professional but better than some professionals like her consistency was amazing at one point there was like a t sound that was like half a millisecond apart from each other like between like 10 or six takes oh it, wow it was amazing super like, super quality imagine recordings. that she had practiced before coming to the studio that's like <laughs> see but that's that's so cool because it's like that builds relationships that you can tap into what yeah. was what was her name yeah. is, is she on like uh soundcloud or spotify anywhere we could hear her music 
Uh, I think there's a YouTube video, but I'm not sure how to find it. Oh, that's fine. I'll Maybe we could uh... check real quick on her, like under her real name. Yeah. What was it? This one. That's awesome. I mean, you know, that's a good example of kind of like uh, both good and bad studio sessions. And also, uh, thank you to Exhale uh, for that 500-bit dono. Or I guess not dono, but that 500-bit uh, cheer. It is September. I don't quite know how the September thing works on Twitch, but thank you anyways. Um, you found it? Yeah, I found it. I found it. Oh, for sure. But it like it's like that's not made by me. I had no part in this. I just I had heard that she has stuff on YouTube. And for like a relatively unknown rapper that raps in a weird Fennel Swedish dialect, 25k is a lot, I think. Yeah, 25k views. Yeah, on YouTube. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have expected it. That's cool. Can I, you... I'll actually have to check that out. Can and you link it in the that's chat? That's the sound I have to beat when I produce and uh, mix and master her forthcoming EP. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, could you drop a link to that in uh, the Twitch chat so that people could take a look at it? Oh, the YouTube one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. And then, um, perfect. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that for myself to watch later. I'm, I'm excited about this. Yeah, yeah me too. Only I six just need to find the time to do it, but I'll probably get to it after I come back from France. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, I guess we can kind of shift more into kind of some some mindset stuff. Um, yeah. So we talked about how you uh, start a new project. Um, sort of like your mindset and stuff, but once you're in a song, um, mm -hmm. like let's say you got like 16 bars or you got like a good skeleton arrangement down, um, what is uh, your process from going from that seed to something that you would have no problem playing out, something that you know you want to finish? Like what is that? Uh, process looking like for you? Uh, that's pretty much the flow state for me, which I, of course, can remember. But like, it usually just goes past like that. And uh, I just wake up and have a song. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. Um, well, but, like, for a less like annoying answer, um, I don't really know. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. Um, well, I guess another way to look at it is, has there ever been a point at which you feel like you're struggling with a project, kind of getting it done? And uh, if so, are there any like techniques or strategies that you use to kind of push through, let's say like writer's block, or do you just not even touch it? Uh, I... I catch myself like lying to myself a lot when I'm doing music. Like, uh, I'll do the rises tomorrow, or uh, I'll think about the second drop tomorrow, or like, I'm not sure what to do with the breakdown. Like, that's bullshit. I do know what the breakdown needs. It like it breaks down. It becomes chill. You put a reverb on like a kick drum and let it ring out and then you have some effects and then you just do the intro again but like a bit different mm -hmm. like everybody knows what's gonna happen next so i just catch myself like lying to myself a lot like that yeah. and uh for example when i'm thinking about doing a second prop which because i usually do like intro build up drop breakdown build up drop thing mm -hmm. uh i find myself thinking that yeah, I don't know what the second drop will be, but it'll like present itself to you when you just copy paste the first drop. And then when you have a picture in your head for the of an uh, of a finished song, then it'll become clear what 
uh, the song needs to not be shit anymore. Because when you have a raw song, it's much easier to pinpoint what is wrong with it than when you don't have even the raw song. You just have a, like half of a song. Yeah. So I guess helping your brain do what it's do what you want it to do would be the tip from me for that that's actually that's actually a really good tip honestly um because i you know uh botic soul in the in the chat is talking about like it's a very relatable response and i think a lot of artists um kind of have that same feeling where it's like they tell themselves i don't know what i'm supposed to do here so yeah, that, rather than what should you do no yeah and, and if you don't who does that's a good point exactly um so i i think that's that's definitely a good tip like just trust yourself and don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today yeah exactly exactly like something like risers that uh, like really help when you need to feel the song to know what you want from it you can just just fucking vengeance one yeah <laughs> like, it doesn't really matter if you want to get creative by all means do that but you don't need to just drag in something yeah just get i have it used done. the same risers since i made stfu my track stfu mm-hmm. uh it has the riser that i use in every song but again it's not that riser that you talk about a lot it's my riser oh god that riser we got i got like two or three submissions yesterday with that fucking riser (laughs) Um, amazing so Amazing. amazing exactly um voyage in chat is saying like when i say i don't know what to do here it usually means i could make something generic but i want to make something cool yeah yeah i get that but then just um to the way to make something cool to me is to first like realize what makes it cool and uh really a lot of times i have like this cool drum groove that i think is real amazing and stuff and then i just do another section that is that has a uh, a lot simpler drum groove, but then again, that's something that people would like to listen to. So uh, what I mean by that is that sometimes you just have to uh, start by doing something generic so you can make that interesting instead of trying to be vessel and exist in a void. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's, it's, that's actually a really good point. Like, uh, like Body Souls and Chad is saying, like, anything cool starts from a boring place. And I mean, um, it's, it's almost, it's more important to get the idea out than to try and have like something really, really good magically flow forth from the ether, kind of from the void, like you're talking about. Um, so it's, it's actually, um, Something that, you know, I struggle with myself uh, sometimes. Like, I don't want to just sit there and make something that's paint by numbers. But at the same time, you know, uh, you don't, no one ever sits down and says, I'm going to write a song. They get an idea and then they iterate upon that idea. And it takes a lot of work to get to that point where it goes from, like I was talking about, like a seed into a workable project. And then it takes more effort to take it from a a workable project to a finished song. So, like, how would you take something like, let's say, the the project that we just listened to. Um, Let's say you thought it was something good enough to finish. So how would you mm-hmm. take that project and go from where you at, have it now, where it's almost a completed arrangement, it's got a lot of ideas, it needs a bit of work. How would you take that and get to a song that you will consider good enough for release? Uh, 
Um, I would uh, advise and try to do what uh, noisier guys, the noisier guys talk about all the time, just messing with it till it sounds good. But like, uh, also, I think that it's it's really important to just do something when you don't know what to do it's good to just do something mm -hmm. and just try different things who knows uh, if that doesn't work it might give you a better idea for another song does that make any sense or no, does that answer the, the that actually question that actually answers the question perfectly no i think that's yeah. a, a really good answer i mean it, it kind of ties into some other questions that i um i want to talk about like how do you deal with writer's block or like self-doubt um it kind of it go, it touches on what voyage is saying like anything i finish is good enough for release because i've been really shit with finishing for some time um and that's kind of a, a separate thing that i want to kind of jump off from from here, but for now, let's kind of talk about what this speaks to, which is like um, self-doubt or writer's block. So where like, you know, anything that I create is fine because right now I can't find my way in creating something. So how do you overcome that sort of insecurity, that sort of mental block, stuff like that? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big, a fan of fake it till you make it as anyone that has come across me online has noticed i'm a really big advocate for that i just like uh prance around and say that i'm the shit you know i know what i'm doing and that i i guess it has some truth in it i feel like i know what i'm doing but then that I mean, I I do get like writer's block, but for that too, it just helps to do something. It doesn't really matter what it is. And uh, trying to reach, uh, oh, I'm not in frame. But yeah, trying to reach a good song and like, uh, getting frustrated with that is not like worth it it's it's much more important or important to me to just like what i'm doing like even the song that i just played when i was doing it i was feeling it hard and i was like yeah fuck yeah this is the best thing i've ever done and that's a great feeling and that's what i'm personally after and uh if i don't like okay of course sometimes you have to force yourself to do some things no of course yeah but like just doing something is good enough to really often take me out of writer's block but it also helps to yeah yeah thank you sure for that follow voyage but yeah, uh, also listening to really bad music is a guilty pleasure and a really great writer's block like breaker for me. Oh, like, okay. I hate to say it, but like I got tired of listening to the hospital podcast. I love the tracks that I have found some really great tracks in there but then there's this some track that there the guys are going crazy over and it's just an aim and break with an like a baseline that you've heard 100 million times before and there's nothing original about it and people still like it so i could do better just start up ableton and i'll do better yeah like, i promise <laughs> i actually love that so i didn't think about that, that. feeling uh, really helps me get out of writer's block depression and stuff. Yeah, like comparing yourself and being like, well, at least I'm not that guy. Um, yeah, and I, I take it, that. it helps a lot when that guy is like popular. People like his stuff. It it helps a lot. Absolutely. I get that. I mean, and I think that kind of ties in with um, the last little thing I want to go into here. 
um, with before we move on to kind of like the the post uh, kind of interview, kind of like the the roundup of everything. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. what can people who are watching right now do to complete more songs if you feel like they have trouble like creating a body of work? Hmm. I'd say uh, it might be a little condescending from coming from me, who's like a literal nobody in the grand scheme of things. But what helped me personally was like, stop being afraid of doing stuff. Like people are so afraid of like, even just boosting with the EQs, just fucking do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, and then, sounding generic is also a thing that people seem to be afraid of just fucking use that 808 clap use that traps hi hat mm -hmm. i mean a lot of things that are really interesting to me at least have that generic thing in them but i don't know stuff like uh for example flume 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 yeah. flume, flume. The ass eater of EDM. <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of his stuff is really interesting and really original, but it still feels familiar, kind of. Like, it's pop music with weird sounds. It's, uh, it's familiar food with a weird spoon. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually very true. Like, it's, I saw someone on Twitter um, who was talking about how Flume is like almost identical, like in terms of like sonic, uh, like quality to like almost a hundred or 200 different, you know, like SoundCloud uh, weird yeah. trap producers, but yeah. he has the team, he has the marketing and he has the sensibility to really create his own lane and take all these weird, like, uh, underground SoundCloud sounds and make a whole project out of them while working with big name artists and people who are rising. You know, Sophie and JPEG Mafia yeah. were both on uh, Hi, This is Flume. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that means, like, you can also be that good you can also be that successful if you know uh how to market yourself if you know how to strategize your uh yeah. your brand and if you just fucking write a shit ton of music if you just do yeah. it um, yeah that's that's the most important part is to go out there and do it like exactly get up and do it yeah and it sounds really simple and a bit stupid and condescending but that's how it is no, it's not kind of sending because it's the truth. Like, you shouldn't have so many reservations about being generic because everyone was generic until they became original. Yeah, yeah. You could always start it out like that. Um, I think Flume dances the fine line to make it easier for normies to do. No, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. that sensibility yeah, and that's is why important. he is so popular. Like, exactly. That's exactly why it's approachable, but it's it feels cool. Yeah, like there's there's a lot, like you were saying, there's a lot of familiarity in it. It follows yeah. basic pop format, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't going too weird with like a lot of harmonic or melodic decisions. But there's mm -hmm. so much stuff that you don't normally hear that um, is uh, just kind of threading that line. Um, so I'm I'm with it. We can we can kind of go in on on the chat in just a second because I can see you I can see you reading. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I have, there's some interesting stuff in the chat. Oh no, absolutely. For example, that I mean, music production is like eighty percent science, so you kind of gotta get all that right first, which is and isn't true, because it helps to know what you're doing, but have like I have talked to a lot of like bigger artists than me and there's always some technical thing i can teach them like i there's like a year back i taught how to make a 
unison sound, like how to make a unison saw to with bass to a guy had that has nine or ten thousand SoundCloud followers. Like he okay. did not know how to use the unison in silent. I just was I, I just went in and uh showed him, yeah, take the sawtooth and use some unison and then pitch it down. And then he was like, Fuck yeah, that's so great. That sounds good. Yeah, I mean I think that's tr- that's like a big a big part of it. It's like they don't think about like the quote unquote science as much as like say you yeah. or I do because yeah. we're into that stuff. We fuck with that. Um, yeah. But for them, like, it's more about completing the music, which I think is a big part of where their success comes yeah. from, is just completing the music. Yeah. And the guy in question, I won't say his name because I'm talking shit about him. You better DM but, me that, though. like, he makes some really great music. Like, oh, yeah. the melodics, the me- melodies are really great. But and the project ha- projects don't have a lot of elements in them, so they're not like bloated. Mm-hmm. But the emotion is there, and that's apparently uh, what people resonate with. Oh, absolutely! I dig that. But um... he doesn't know. Like basically, he doesn't know what he's doing. He just knows that he's doing music, and he does the music part well. So you don't have to know the science behind it it helps uh, like when you think about uh how long uh uh 20 hertz cycle is in milliseconds yeah it it's like something it will like something like 50 milliseconds i guess so if you want to that to come through your compressor you need to have an attack that's over 50 milliseconds so what that wraps into is using slower attack times to get more low end, low end punch in your mixes. That's the kind of science that really helps you to make uh, better sounding music, but it, you don't need it. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing with music theory. You don't have to know it, but it can help. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's very true um, because uh, I don't know if you watched the one uh, interview I did with uh, Mr. Bill, but we talked a little uh, bit about I catch, that. Like the end of it. Oh yeah, like there is there is something to be said for you know um, a lot of people's concerns that like learning all this stuff hinders your uh, creativity because they know all these people yeah. who you know. Um, you know, Getter, I know, has talked about how he has no engineering knowledge. Like, he didn't go to school for engineering. He didn't go to school for music theory. He just learned little tidbits. Um, mm-hmm. And I think his music sounds really good. Um, I'm not a, a huge fan of a lot of uh, his songwriting choices, but I think he's yeah. a talented yeah, I, I can, producer. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I think that, you know... A lot of people look at that. They look at people like Bill, who doesn't have any music theory background, but he has all these really wonderful melodies, these really unique sense of harmony. And they take that as, I shouldn't learn these things. But it's more, you don't need to. It's like saying, um, you don't need to learn to read um, Arabic to learn to speak the language. You can just learn that by talking to a bunch of people who speak Arabic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and having them show you all these little things. And eventually you'll create your own sense of essentially theory about how to communicate in that way. Um, yeah. And I think that that is something that a lot of people misconstrue. Um, when they are uh, getting into, you know, learning audio engineering, learning music theory, b- songwriting in general, yeah, um, yeah, which is which is really kind of uh, definitely a it's a blessing and a curse. I'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's it's funny because you kind of have to know a decent amount of about music production or mixing or the technology behind it or music theory to know how little of it matters 
like I was I was when I started like uh, learning about scales and stuff I was like I was really it was a crutch because I was stuck because I wanted to use the uh, Phrygian mode I just didn't know the name for it and I was like but can this be good because it's not in the minor key it's not in the minor scale the yeah. flat two is not in minor scale I was like but then when you learn that that has a name and literally every single thing that you can do in like music has a name for it oh yeah so when you know that you know that you can do anything and it'll be quote unquote right exactly um so i think that's actually a good a good way to pivot into kind of these last couple of questions um i guess we could start off with like are there any additional like tips or little tricks or at least just like words of advice that you might have for other producers? Because, I mean, you might think that you are, you know, a nobody, but from my experience, you are an incredibly talented producer. You're an amazing and songwriter. You're a really, really skilled engineer. You know really what you're doing. That. Um, even if you haven't yet gotten the... I what I'll call the numbers to back it up. Exactly. Like just seeing your body of work shows your skills to me. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that a lot of people can take away. Like, yeah, Diplo is super well known, touring the world, stuff like that. And I'm not knocking his skills or his quality, but you know, there are tons of people, even here in the Twitch music producer community, who mm -hmm. I would say are like way more skilled, way more talented, and mm -hmm. a few of them are finally starting to get their comeuppance. They're starting to yeah. get some more renown. So, like, there are people who, even if they don't have the numbers, like you're saying, I still mm -hmm. trust them for this. So, you know, I want to know what you would say for, like, just things that you wished we'd had talked about during this, um, any tips that you might have, or just things that you want to say to people who are either struggling with the areas that you uh, feel comfortable in or are just kind of feeling like they are a little bit lost? Uh, my favorite, like, uh, really small things that were really big for me were, like, uh, my, a teacher said to me that, like, just fucking crank it. Like, I had a song that had really distorted sounds and, like, uh, a heavy beat and rapping and stuff. But it sounded, uh, like, not tough, like a wuss, mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. And uh, he said to me, Look, just try some hardware or something. You can just crank it. And I have the, then you have, you'll have the physical feeling of cranking it. Then I just took that and just went home and like distorted a bunch of shit way too hard and now that's kind of my sound i guess mm -hmm. but like don't be afraid to like do stuff like that or boost with an eq like people are really afraid of doing that too like for some reason i don't know why other thing is uh the second thing i'd like to say is that don't try to overcomplicate your songwriting at the structure phase. Like the structure is uh, the stuff you should uh, worry the least about. Because yeah, yeah. you can do so much within the basic generic structure that you'll have a lifetime work just for one song structure. Uh, a little thing is, uh, or just like a couple of final things that uh, I'd like to say is that don't be afraid to use like slow attack times on your compressors. I really, really hate when I hear tracks that have the kick drum just as a snap. Mm -hmm. And that's a symptom of using a too fast of a uh, attack time like with compression try to try the fastest re uh, fastest release and the slowest attack you can 
unless we're talking about some weird compressor like like the Pro C or the digital one in uh, Ableton. But like for example, the glue. Yeah. Just max out the attack, minimize the uh, uh, the minimum release, use the fastest one, and then go from there. Like that that opened up compressors for me a lot. And then uh lastly clipping. Just fucking clip it. Yeah, uh, I mean don't waste your time on limiter like uh settings. Just uh if you have Pro L2, just choose the fucking what is it? Yeah, what was the one you like a, clipping. Yeah, practically and then clipping is the one that you told me it. is. Yeah, I've and that's basically how I've gotten my masters to sound not only louder but cleaner. Ever since you yeah. told me that, like it's just not overthinking the limiting, and it's like um, just yeah, kind of don't don't touch it, like leave it on there. Because uh, there are times where you'll have to bring out your sound and what it is that is your sound, but your limiter options. Or settings won't be that. Oh yeah, um, it's. I mean, like the specifics of the the limiting is a thing. It's like I remember because um, you were talking about, <coughs> you know, your your teacher told you just crank it, just turn the volume up, and um, uh, it reminds me of an interview I saw with Flux Pavilion, where he talked about how um, Bass Cannon was uh, mm-hmm. clipping out of the master before he sent it off to the label and they told him, hey, put a limiter on at the end. Um, and that's the only reason there's a limiter on it because he thought it sounded good. Yeah, and he was good. like, why? <laughs> it sounds yeah. good. And, and he was saying that people asked him how he got his basses so loud and he said, I turned them up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's so funny how, um, like, a lot of the producers who a lot of us look up to they don't like think so hard about all these specific mathematically yeah, perfect not things. Technical people, because they're artists. Exactly. Exactly. I, I I feel like a lot of those people are artists first, and then producers, yeah. and that's why, because because they have an idea of vibe of like vision, uh, aesthetic, which are all more important than your limiter setups and fucking all of it. Absolutely. If that song is good and it resonates with people, it's a lot more important than the fact that it's like technically good. Yeah. Like focus and this is something that I've I've told a lot of people. It's like don't worry about mixing. Don't worry about mastering. Focus on songwriting, especially for like the first like what would you say like two three years, maybe even more. Like, don't even fucking yeah. care about like your mix downs. If your songwriting is on point, like a good song can survive a shitty mix down, but a yeah. great mix down can't fix a shit song. Yeah, and uh, about that actually, uh, people worry about their mix downs a lot, and uh, a lot of it. Is that and uh, a worrying part of songs that I, I've seen my friends do and stuff, uh, have been mixed in a way that they make the song and do the balance while they while they're while they are doing the song, and then when everything's there, they just listen to it on repeat and try to pick out what's like bad and then add a plugin, but like you can get so far with just uh putting all the faders to minus infinite and then just raising them one by one it's such a textbook thing but it's the best move i've ever done like when i started doing that for my mixes and my mixes have not been the same since it sounds silly uh, and it sounds like it's a lot of work doing the balance like that yeah. but it isn't it really isn't no it's really Even not i i have tracks that have like a hundred tracks in them and it's done in a couple of hours yeah if you just go one by and one if you're thinking about if a song uh, if a part in a song is too loud or like a part or like a track a track uh, an, an individual track just try one db at a time 
is minus six better than minus seven? And usually you can hit a good balance with just one dB increments or like decreases in volume. Mm -hmm. And then just like lift the fader until it's not too quiet anymore. And you will have a perfectly good starting point for a good mix. Yeah, that's super... everything else is extra. Yeah, no, that's that's so true. I mean, for me, like the mix is like ninety percent in the faders. Um, yeah, like because yeah. I mean, I I don't remember who told me. It might have been even you who told me about it. But like, I I literally have my default projects. Whenever I load a new instrument track, it's at minus infinity volume. Whenever I load a new audio track, it's at minus infinity volume. So like I force myself to gain stage that way as I'm writing. Um, and, and even then still, I'll go back to the end, turn everything back down and mix it one more time, pulling everything up. And it just, it's yeah. so like, it's almost like Zen. It's like I'm meditating while I'm doing it because I'm only like, I'm only in the moment. I'm only working on that yeah. thing and getting that you thing get sounding good. You get into the flow state really exactly. well when you're doing that. Absolutely. And also it gives you, a uh, good opportunity to uh, check what you have on the track, what plugins are there, what needs to be there, what it might need, mm -hmm. and uh, then just have it have the mix playing that you have at that point, like even the drums, and then do your EQ decisions based on the what it sounds in the mix instead of what it sounds like when it's solo. Totally, totally. I mean, I really, I really dig that. Um, well, and that'll get you like that'll level up your mixes. I promise. Oh, easily. Even if your like room is shitty, like this room is imperfect, but I have the room correction thing on here. But like, it'll still help a lot. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, even if you're mixing on like Apple earbuds, just like yeah. knowing how to gain stage is is everything. What is this? As long as the little meters between each device in my chain don't pop red, it's staged enough for civil service. I mean, they can pop red. Yeah, it's as long as thirty-two it... bit. Like, don't worry about it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, all right. So let's. If it do... doesn't distort, like in a way that you don't want it to, then it's okay. Exactly. Yeah. So let's let's pick one or the other. Do you want to talk yeah. about uh, a little bit of doll war stuff, or do you want to talk about the music industry? Let's do one or the other. Um, door Wars is really quick. Use what's best for you. Best for you. There's a place for everyone, and uh, logic is bad. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Get some incisive opinions in there. Um, well, then, uh, I guess we can just move on to uh, what's coming for Sila down the road, and then we can take a couple of, of viewer questions. I know yeah, sure. Voyage had a good question that we can um, talk about. But first, like, why don't you tell us about what's coming up in the next like six months to a year uh, for the Sila project or for you? Uh, more tracks. I'm trying to put out a track per month. So that'll be three more tracks this year. Uh, I don't really have any any remixes in the pipeline i had that symbionic remix in like i sat on that for a long long time i think i did it in december last year it's mm. it's pretty old at this point and um but yeah i have a couple of collaborations in the works and uh, i've been meeting some meeting some and talking to some really interesting people as of late but like i'm just trying to do some more music i'm with that i'm with that no and I'm, plus the show in france if you're in france northern france and you're attending this festival then come and say hi yeah, <laughs> i go. guess <laughs> go see go see go see this person right here go go watch Sila dj and give him some support um, all right, so let's let's move on to some viewer questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to just drop it in chat. Um, but we can start with a Voyage's question. Um, is there a method to finish the layout of a song and then mess with it? 
uh, I always end up with a loop that sounds cool but isn't a song. Sorry, what was that? Um, so the question is, uh, is there uh, any sort of method or technique that you can uh, suggest for Voyage for finishing the layout or the structure of a song and then messing with that? I have an, I have a way that I usually do that, but why don't you go first? Because it's your interview. Mm, just if you're doing EDM, just intro, build up, drop, breakdown, which is intro to electric boogaloo, <laughs> build up, drop outro start with that and uh you'll get far i i would say no i, I actually agree. is that answering the question yeah no that totally that totally gets for it i mean i i could give a bit more of a of a developed thing like if i let me actually open up ableton yeah i mean quick. i bet you're more elo eloquent with this um, whole subject than i am uh i wouldn't say eloquent um <laughs> But you forgot to add the boots and cats. Yeah. Um, so the way that the way that I approach song structure is um, I don't think about uh, coming up with structure. I use a shell and then I, I modify that. So yeah. we're going to move away from the, the, the webcams right now. Um, yep. So this is my Ableton session that, that people on stream can can see on the screen. And I have this for every project um and rather than think about like intro outro build break whatever i divide my song into more classical uh structures of like an a section a b section and then like a c section or a d section for like bridges and variations and i just look at it as uh, kind of like you see on screen, like every eight bars, there's going to be some section change, even though I tend to have it like an A section leads into an A section or what I often call like A.2. Like I can go over to my, my stream template and that has it a bit more laid out. This is just my my main working production session. There you go. So you can see like I just sort of float between two sides of a greater kind of um, kind of macro section. And I look at like these B sections and A sections as um, there should be drastic changes here. Like the B section should feel like it's the same song as the A section, but it shouldn't sound like the A section. So, you know, maybe if you get a loop done, that's your A section loop. Now you just have to figure out how to get a 16 bar section out of that with a big transition in the middle. And then just create a new idea. Take all the same parts, rework them, add new things, take out the old things and get yourself like a drop going or a chorus yeah. or a oh. hook. And then return to the main idea, but change it. That's why you have A1 and A2. Go back yeah, to yeah. the drop. Do the same thing. Give yourself, you know, some major textural shift, which, you know, in the, the pop music world is the bridge. You know, a yeah, bridge yeah. is a really, really good tool for giving the audience's ear some sort of break some sort of deviation so that when you return to your main idea, when you return to the A section, the B section, um, it feels familiar. It feels like we've returned home and it's not mm -hmm. as repetitive or not as stale. Um, yeah. But like following this structure, like people have been using this, like almost this identical structure for like 200, like a, B, 300 years. A, B, A, B, years. C, B. Oh, wait, that's... Yeah, it's... it's a, B, A, B. C, C A B A. A B. Yeah, I mean okay. the the way, like it's it changes up. Like sometimes you go C B A, um, but the the way that I have it structured is like, let's say this is pop song or pop music. Yeah, you this have, is, uh, yeah. I was thinking about pop songs when they they like ninety percent of the time they're just like A B A B C B. Yeah, um, and I'm just I'm just adding in literally like an extra verse after the bridge, which you don't need, and that kind of gets to uh, what Voyager was talking about with with messing with it, where you know, like it changes. I mean, it changes a lot between genres. It really doesn't. That's the thing. If you break this down not into intro, verse, chorus, or intro hook. Um, drop whatever. If you just look at it as an A section, a B section, and a C section, mm -hmm. every song is going to follow this basic structure. 
and there might be variations yeah, in, like you in might have some little... way or another i guess yeah. like you might I, have little... I, I also get what voyager is voyage not voyager voyage is saying but because like a lot of edm songs don't have c parts or c section oh yeah there's there's rarely a bridge in uh dance music nowadays which i'm trying to change personally yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and nothing wrong with that yeah but i i'm just saying that i get what he's saying no totally totally yeah. um so yeah i would say like that's that's sort of the idea don't don't overthink the structure i think is kind of the main takeaway here yeah. you know the patterns have Absolutely. been put forth for like i said like hundreds of years uh if it works why not use it and then if you want to change it just insert silence yeah um, and be sure that uh, make sure it works because sometimes it just doesn't work because it feels weird. Like imagine, like let's compare compare like um, songs to movies. If you go to a movie theater and the song, uh, not the song, the movie starts with anything else than uh, going through the characters, like. Uh, making sure that the view, viewer knows the characters. And mm -hmm. if there's something else than the climax at like a real a little after one hour, it'll just feel weird. If the like the climax of the movie is twenty minutes in. What the fuck is happening? Like oh, yeah. it just feels wrong. And that uh the conventions are are there because they work exactly no that's 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 definitely it like the the patterns the cliches they're there yeah. for a reason and, and what is a uh you know what is a genre if not a collection of tropes and conventions that people do <laughs> unless you're watching game of thrones geez no comment. No comment here on the Game of Thrones uh, series on uh, HBO. Uh, everyone is welcome to their opinions on the way that they ended that uh, series. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I see some people commenting on stuff uh, in chat. Um, I don't know if we have many more questions right now. Oh, actually, uh, um, that reminds me. Yeah. Uh, who was it? Theo? Yeah, who Theo Dillon. Felt, felt weird when With I people, said his name. So yeah. Theo uh, said something about mixing. Yeah, oh, I guess it just, yeah. I just mean a shitty mix is a shitty mix. And I guess, I, I feel like that's, there's a lot of unpack, uh, a lot to unpack there. Because, um, I mean, this is not like any. This is this is not textbook stuff. This is like my opinion on things stuff. That uh, mixing is an art form. Yes, it's subjective only to a point, or rather, after said point. Mm -hmm. Like when you're mixing a song. Uh, the objective there is to is to make it work, make it sound good, and good in here means that appropriate. And what the uh, what appropriate means is it, that that differs from time to time. Most times it means that uh, drums have to punch through; they have to feel good. If that doesn't happen, it's not a good mix. Um, if there, there needs to be an appropriate amount of top end on the instruments so they feel good and bright, and mm -hmm. uh, there needs to be a certain level of intelligibility. And uh, it only starts getting subjective, like when. I can't say that it needs to have a song needs to have a certain amount of top end for it to be good. 
that is not true because there's such things as lo-fi house or something. Mm-hmm. But even those are mixed like good, even though the po- whole point of them is to be shitty. They're shitty, but in a good way and in an, in an intentional way, in yes. an appropriate way. Exactly, yeah. The intentionality is really big here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's why I think that mixing and a good mix is like craftsmanship more, mm-hmm. than, more than artistry. Because if you're a carpenter and you make a f- table or something and the legs don't like... If they're not, if they break apart, as I'm trying to say, yeah. Absolutely. If the table doesn't stay together, Two it's a fucking baby. bad table. Same thing with mixing; it just needs to work. After that comes the style and the vibe and stuff like that. Oh yeah, no, I mean it's it's uh, like it's it's kind of funny because what people were are talking about in chat like someone were talking about like mozart and stuff like for mozart like mozart is the quintessential craftsman composer he like 90 yeah. percent of mozart's music maybe more was done 100 percent on um like on commission essentially like he was the yeah. first working man's composer he was the first composer that was not like I am the servant of the king. I work yeah. for the duke. No, he's like, I'm going to go out and uh, I'm going to go find all these people and I'm going to go create, like, li- like, literally, he was one of the first EDM producers before there was the E part. Like, he wrote <laughs> court music for, like, dances and stuff. And it was all, like, super, like, I'm just getting the job done. It's just, like I said in chat, like, just painting by numbers and following all the patterns like he'd been trained his whole life for it so it was it was natural for him it was second nature but it was all just making the music based on the rules quote-unquote that was put in place at the time um and you know we can we can dress him up in a huge pink wig and and have uh um, you know, Amadeus is as a big reference point, but no, like he was doing work. And if you can look at, in my opinion, if you can look at all of your processes in music as a craft, less as like, I'm going to be this wonderful artist who creates tapestries of sound. Like, no, yeah, you're a engineer. You are a songwriter. You are a craftsman. You are no different from the person who makes that chair, who makes that yeah. sofa. The only difference is they have a physical object and you have sound waves, essentially. But you're both filtering your experiences through your craft. So if you work on the craft, yeah. the art will follow. Um, but but yeah. also... Uh, it doesn't really matter at this point because Mozart is a legend, but he also died in poverty. That is very true. He died a poor man. Um, yeah. So, you know, artistic integrity has its potential limits. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Let's see. Uh, let's see. And uh, 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 I'd like to. There was um, Seed music. Yeah. C E D E. Uh, yeah. He said that he actually brought out Mozart and he said that, um, fuck, I can't find it. But like uh, something along the lines of a shitty mix doesn't make yeah. uh, a Mozart song bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. It just is a shitty mix. And that's the point. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's that's a really big part of this. Um, but let's... Let's answer uh, Botic Soul's question. By the way, Madism, thank yeah, you sure. for that two-month uh, resub. I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Botic Soul said, I missed a lot of this interview. I'd like to ask, is there something associated with music production that you wish you would do more or you would stop pushing back? Um, maybe 
I would like to learn how to play the piano or like keys a little bit better so I could um, improvise and therefore write songs on a keyboard instrument. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to do more, but I don't because I'm lazy and I have strain injuries on both my arms. So my arms start hurting like after... 10 minutes of playing. Oh no, I feel that. Well, yeah, but that's, uh, that's my own fault. Like, do you see how I'm sitting? <laughs> yes, I see. I mean, I see your leg more than I see your body right now. Yeah. Yeah. And when I did music in like this sort of position for like the first five years and uh, didn't like exercise at all, that'll do it. Yeah, I think that's cute, though, honestly. But that's just me. Yeah, I mean, but it's my own fault totally. like for not exercising and not like taking care of myself, which I now try to do more because it kind of sucks being in pain. Totally. 24/7. Absolutely. No, I uh, get that. Uh, bad deal, I'd say. <laughs> Pretty, not good. Not good. Um, anyways, uh so unless anyone has any other uh, questions in chat, I feel like we can uh, we can start wrapping this up. Yeah, sure. Sound good? Because I'm sure it's I'm sure it's late. Uh, what time is it over there in Finland right now? Uh, One a.m. Ooh, okay. We should probably start wrapping up then, because I know you want to uh, start prepping for your trip and everything. Um, yeah. But <laughs> hey, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, no, was, thanks for having me. Thanks no, for having me. This was super fun. I feel like people learned a lot. Uh, I hope was... they did. And uh, you can always ask me questions on Discord. Don't be afraid to tag me. You, I'm always online. Yeah, Sila, Sila hangs out in my Discord. Uh, you can find Sila in like the Mr. Bill Discord over yeah. here. Um, so we're we're usually over here in one of these channels. So feel free to drop by and uh, say hello. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much again. Uh, you can say your, say your goodbyes to everyone and then we'll, uh, we'll take off. Uh, uh, this is the part where I plug my shit. So yes, indeed. check out my shit. <laughs> yep. Sila music pretty much everywhere, right? Or just Sila? Pretty much everywhere. It's Sila, Sila music. Well, how do you pronounce I think, it? Except soundcloud might be just sila i don't know but you'll find me yeah you'll you'll be able to hunt him down sila awesome well thank you so much Uh, i'm gonna take off here here. absolutely love you buddy all right how do i end this call you just leave meeting end meeting goodbye (laughs) all righty that is it for uh See, hold on. Boop. There we go. That is it for Sila.